They address the story in moving pictures. In the last few years I've had the pleasure of exploring people and streets in such places as Chile, Argentina, South Africa, New Zealand, Malaysia, the Netherlands, Wales and Ireland. I've drank in many beautiful experiences. I travelled alone as I wanted to take risks. I wanted unsafe adventures. I desired to indulge certain appetites. I did this as I wanted to push into a broader view of the world. One might imagine vast cultural divides between people on this earth. If one had lived a sheltered life, if you know better, good for you. People really are essentially the same the world over. There are some interesting differences. Some of these differences are worth preserving. I've walked in many foreign lands without a financial or political agenda. The story in pictures is life through one lens. It is disjointed. And it does jump around in space and time. It doesn't require a critical evaluation. The words I choose to share here will also tell a story. I wish to tell you about my life, from childhood to adulthood. Hi, I'm Trent. I'll be your narrator. Please sit back and relax for a while, if you're able. And so, a jumping off point is needed. I'll let you decide what this is. If you say it's a confessional, then that's what it is. If you say something else, sure, why not? I was drawn to him before I was even aware of myself, in a sense. I hadn't been conditioned to feel shame yet, so expressing my curiosity was not difficult. He didn't seem to be particularly bothered by my advances. If we hadn't been interrupted, something might have come of it, but the authorities were never going to allow for that. This was the first time I was cut short. Twelve years of my life were spent being institutionalised. I can't undo myself. I am formed. Tis done, tis done. I truly believe that I was able to resist for a while at least. I didn't join a group. I kept to myself and gave off the impression that I wasn't much interested in humans. This can only work for so long though. Eventually I was found out. I took a couple of humiliating beatdowns. Once at the hands of an established tough guy, and then again by a younger ape looking to put his name in the mouths of the higher-ups. For my part, I couldn't hide my hurt. But with time, others forgot. It was unexpected when I achieved some degree of popularity. My warped sense of humour went over quite well for a while. It was indeed intoxicating, but it did not last long. We were moved to a new and larger institution when we reached a certain age. Once you get a taste of other people's admiration, you are hooked. Or at least I was. The problem was, I didn't know how to get it and keep it. There isn't a magic formula. It kind of just happens. If you're in the right place, making the right moves at the ideal time, yeah, the stars have to align. When we reached the new place, we quickly understood that we were at the bottom of the deck. New uniforms, new bosses, but it was basically the same structure. What tends to happen initially is that you stick with the people you know from the old place for protection, and you size up the strangers. As the weeks go by, the strangers become less strange. 
after a few months, you see smaller groups uniting to form larger ones. All the time there is a process of testing, initiating, rejecting and accepting. What went wrong with me and my best friend, I can't accurately explain. The place, the Ivano as we called it. It was an emotional minefield. The best looking guys found each other after a feeling out period, so to speak. The top ladies did the same. None of this shit is written down or carved in stone, but we can all see and feel it happening. Anyway, me and my mates were able to find a couple of other rejects and were able to form a little group. We were no doubt held in contempt by most of those around us. We were the other kids. If a normie was seen talking to one of us in the yard, he might have to answer some rather pointed questions from his group leader later on. A new arrival came to us just before the Christmas period. It was strange that I didn't recognise him at first, given the amount of time I had spent looking at him in the old place. When I did finally clock who it was, well, what can I say? How does one describe waking up in that way? It may well be nothing more than biology, but for me it was my first spiritual experience. You may well laugh when I say that. But to me, he was beautiful. It might sound odd to your ears, but I felt like this was something I possessed. I could own it. Perhaps the reality was that given my inexperience, I was possessed. I could not control my physical reactions to him. And my thought process was all over the place. Given where we were and the rules of the game at that time, there was no way I was ever going to be able to tell him how I felt. To do so would have been irresponsible. It would have placed him in needless danger. The place was bad enough as it was. In time, this infatuation crumbled and fell away. Yeah. Maybe we had been at the Ivano for a year or more when my friends started to notice girls in the obvious fashion, and so new rivalries and fresh cruelties abounded. The truth of the matter is that as soon as biology starts to aggressively shove children down the long and painful road to adulthood. Former bonds can be dissolved without much discussion. Bridges that were essential in getting here can be blown up. Some friendships will persist. Others will be strained to breaking point. Nature pushes most, the vast majority in fact, in a certain direction. It's crude and somewhat brutal, but it works. Some of us don't get swept down that river though. Some of us get thrown into another stream. I suppose the realisation that you are not normal can be distressing. But it's never been a question of right versus wrong. The concern is simple enough. When you're on the fringe of something, you are vulnerable. When the normies start to notice that you are not in the big tent, well, some of the straights will sound the alarm. The upsetting thing is when your friends turn their backs. This doesn't happen overnight. Firstly, they are content to make fun, cruel jibes, 
can be a way of gaining social points as you look to move up the board. But of course, words would eventually give way to kicks and punches. This might be one of the first times you start to notice the cyclical nature of social interactions. After a few beatings, the attackers will get bored or distracted. There are girls to be chased and other queers to be sorted out, after all. Yeah, those fairies aren't going to batter themselves. All things are not equal. All people are not equal. Most folks will stand by or turn away when they see you being targeted. There are a rare few, though, who will step in and try to shame the attackers into walking away. Sometimes it works. Unsurprising that those who did step in were always females who had matured more so than their peers. Maybe now would be a good time. Yes, why not? Let me name some names. Names from the past. Seth was my best friend for a while. In fact, even after he had essentially betrayed and abandoned me, I still managed to get back on board with him. On side, maybe I should say. Why did I bother, you may well ask. I forgave him because I could. It's a healthy thing to do, and it's a selfish thing to do. I know he liked me as a friend, and I had a little suspicion that he liked me in that way also. Of course, he could never admit to this or act on his feelings, or he would have been destroyed. His family might have kicked him to the curb. I could never have told my parents the truth about myself either. Different times back then. Acceptance and tolerance were not in vogue in the early to mid-90s. Not where I grew up. Seth wasn't too smart. I wouldn't call him stupid either. He was dangerous and a rebel. He had a magnetic, bad boy sort of charisma, a personality that drew some in and repelled others. In the village where we grew up, we were labelled as the bad kids and the parents of other children would tell their young ones to steer clear of us. We formed a trio with another troubled youth who lived close by. His nickname was Caddy. I never did find out why that was. It seemed like a silly name in hindsight. Yeah, that kid was a total prick. He used to fuck with me on the daily, and he'd bully other kids too. He wasn't a big lad, but he had some heavy backup. His two brothers were kind of feared in the neighbourhood. And other local thugs had his back as well. So the way he saw it, he had free reign to act like the Prince of the Shire or whatever. I would have loved to have given this little shit a proper fucking beating. I had fantasies about doing him over back then. Yeah. I would lure him into the local woods and give him what he had coming with her lead pipe or some such weapon. Never did act on my criminal intentions though. In the end I forgave him too. As I understand, his life didn't turn out so great. I think his parents splitting up when he was 12 or 13 might well have messed him up at an important stage and so he carried that hurt forward into his adult life. Kind of sad, but that's life. We all have to suffer 
And we all have our burdens to bear. Apologies for the cliché, folks. Who else was a key player in my youth? My two brothers were always there for me. I could have treated my younger brother better. I was having a hard time of it during my teenage years, and I took it out on him on more than one occasion. He turned out alright though. He's a smart dude. He really has his shit together. This is more than can be said for me. My other brother is like a father figure to me. My actual dad was absent for a time and it really got to me. My mother could be a harsh woman so I didn't go looking for affection there. But my older brother was a rock. Having said that, I could still hide things even from him. I was good at hiding things as a youngster. It was a special talent of mine. A useful talent when growing up around many people who don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. Another key player back in the day would have been Bobby. Bobby didn't hang out with me, Seth and Caddy. He wanted me all to himself. I found him to be an insecure and jealous kid, but he wasn't without his charm. He was popular with the ladies, which I think made Seth and Cad a wee bit green-eyed. When we were 16, and in the process of doing our leaving exams, we got a bit closer because we had been in the same school sets going into the final running. And so we studied together, as this made sense. I must say I liked his family and his home more than I liked him. His mum was a cool hippie type, a child of the 60s who had done all right for herself. His old man was a pretty cool guy. Smart guy, with a laid-back attitude. Anyway, one day, after we had been revising together, we went out to the store with the intention of lifting a few drinks. He distracted the shopkeeper, while I loaded a few ciders into my oversized jacket, which would have looked suspicious as the thing was bigger than me. We got away with the booze, and it was really exciting. We took our ill-gotten gains to a nearby bridge under the railway tracks and got a buzz on. The way he was talking could only mean he was looking for one thing. He was under the impression that I was experienced in a way that I wasn't. For the first time in my young life, I shoved my feelings aside and went with the animal. I kind of jumped his bones and forced my way into his mouth. I figured he would either go with it or panic and beat the hell out of me. In truth, he seemed to freeze a bit, but what do you know, he did get into it. I sucked him off. He was impressed. I was pleased with myself for doing well, apparently, on my first go. What are the chances? He was very cheerful and talkative on the way back to his house, as you could imagine. When I left to go home that evening, he asked me if he could stay over at mine tomorrow night. I said sure. He liked me more than I liked him, but I wanted to see where this would go. It went about how I thought it would, with a couple of surprises thrown in. When it came time to put the candles out, he wanted me to pretend I was a girl, and he wanted to 
pull my hair when we fucked. I had long hair in those days. I said, sure, no problem, as long as he agreed to be gentle and keep the noise down as there were others in the house. It was nice. A bit messy, not perfect, but nice. He did well in his exams and so went on to do A-levels. I did not, so I went on to technical college. And at college, I spent two years learning shit about computers which would not serve me well at all when I stepped out into the big, wide world of work. I never did see Seth, Caddy, or the lovely Bobby after my school days. I got in with a different crowd at college and started hanging with the goth kids. I never went full goth myself, but I was morbid enough to be a fringe member of the crew. These were good times. These were some of the happiest days of my life. That might sound cheesy as fuck, but I'm a cheesy fuck. What can I say? The group was a dirty half dozen of social outcasts. The three ladies were Joanne, Liz and Becky. Two dudes were Matt and Dan. Joanne was kind of shy until she got a couple of drinks down her. The more she drank on a night out, the more lusty she got. Sometimes she just couldn't keep her hands to herself. Liz was even worse than Joanne when the mood took her. But she didn't need any alcohol to get warmed up, so to speak. They were both intelligent young women, and I got the sense that they both knew where they were going in life. Becky was somewhat more unsure of herself. At least that's how I saw it. I can't think why she was unsure as she was super smart, really clever. She was a painter who wasn't keen on letting her friends see her art. Whenever we were able to get a peek, we were all impressed by the depth and darkness of her work. Yeah. I felt like I could relate to Becky more so than Liz, as I was quite guarded myself in my late teens. Yeah. Her attitude, I guess it made sense to me. It's a difficult time at that age for a number of reasons. I think college smartened me up a fair bit, socially speaking. I got out a bit more and saw more of young people in a less formal environment. It was in my second year of college, which turned out to be my last year in the education system, that I discovered drugs. Oh, but first a little about Matt and Dan, yes. Dan was more of a troubled young man, I think, even though Matt had his issues too. Dan, well, yeah, he had three sisters and two brothers. He had aunts and uncles coming out of the walls. He was from a big family. And His family was often at war with itself. One of his uncles had been in prison for manslaughter, and that guy worked at a pub not too far from us during those hazy days. Dan was the black sheep of his tribe. Yeah, dressed all in black, with the big leather boots and the very fetching mascara. He was a splendid sight on the bus at 8.30 in the morning. Matt 
was very much the trench coat and fedora wearing type. You've seen him before, that type. He had been brought up by his grandmother after his mother passed. His father was not a responsible man and Matt tried to keep his interactions with his dad to a bare minimum. It was clear he resented the man and this shaped his personality. Which isn't to say that Matt was an angry guy. He was certainly a fun-loving sort of a chap, but he had a fire in him and was clearly someone with real principles. I'm not sure how or even why Dan and Matt clicked so well as friends, but they just did. You know, two people are on the same wavelength when they can share what to me seems like an uncomfortable silence with no problems or tension. For my part, I was fairly well liked by the guys and the girls. I kept my mouth shut much of the time and really tried to listen to people. I wasn't coming at people with a message or an agenda. I wanted to learn and get past the defences to see characters. Humans in all their glory. Maybe I'm fooling myself. Maybe I did have an agenda. In that I was making emotional connections. Which felt profound to me. And so I craved that more as I went along. Looking back, I think Liz might have been in love with Matt, and he could well have been aware of this. They will have slept together, of course, but that would have just been par for the course. Okay, back to the drugs. First it was smoking pot. A good place to start, right? This was quite a revelation to me. My preconceptions were pretty much smashed. And it wouldn't be the last time. First time we got high at Dan's house in the downstairs toilet was quite the experience. There was me, Dan, Matt, and Liz, all crammed into this little space smoking Dan's homegrown, which he had dried out in the microwave. We were all hitting the pipe, no joint smoking, and we were all coughing hard and heavy, as I remember. Strangely enough, my memory of all the things which were said in that confined space are not great. What I can remember, with a good deal of clarity, even to this day, more than 20 years after, was the three of us, minus Dan, walking back towards the bus stop. It was late October, and there was that autumnal smell hanging thick in the air. I didn't know the time exactly, but it was dusk. It could have been a ten minute walk to the stop, or we could have been stumbling along for three hours. I was so fucked. I felt fantastic. So, I fell in love with that substance pretty quickly and started getting stoned on the regular. It wasn't long before other things were being pushed under my nose. Soon enough, I was doing speed, magic mushrooms and LSD. A lot of this shit was coming my way, and to my friends, for free. Dan was a well-connected dude, and he made sure his friends got what they asked for. Getting shredded on hallucinogenics is a lot of fun, 
Don't let guidance counsellors and the police tell you otherwise, kids. The last six months of college were an extended party, basically. I managed to keep up with the work pretty easily, as the course was not so difficult. I would have carried on if I were able to do so. But the good times had to come to an end. My parents had about had enough of each other by the time I was 18. They split in the summer of 1999, which is when I finished my course. I chose to go and live with mum, as I thought dad would be a nightmare on his own. My younger brother went with the old man and, yeah, he found this out for himself. I don't think the guy was ever cut out to be a parent. He just had kids because it's something people do. There are lots of blokes like that. Anyway, it was time to go try and earn some money. At the same time, I was attempting to adapt to my new surroundings. As was the case with school, I left behind my old acquaintances and moved forward as me, myself and I. Doing fresh starts is a theme of my life. What happened to the old gang? Becky made it big. Lives in New York now. A well-respected artist. I've seen her doing TV interviews a few times over the years. Never did hear from Joanne again. I did hear from Liz a few years back. She has a family now and works as a care worker. She seems happy. Dan has been in and out of prison over the last 20 years. I've heard through the grapevine. Not massively surprised, I'm sad to say. I do hear from Matt every now and again. He lives just outside London with his missus and young daughter. Cool guy. I always liked Matt. He told me he dropped the trench coat after college. By the time the new millennium rolled around, it started to get old, that look. Worth saying here before I forget. As far as my look went back in the day, I think I invented emo. I'm putting it out there. I, Trent Burton, did invent the trend and subculture known today as emo. You're welcome, world. What came next was a bit of a surprise. My brother organised a little fishing trip for the both of us down in Norfolk. This was the height of summer and the weather was gorgeous. We basically hired out a boat to go around the canal systems. We were lightly armed with tackle and a big bag of weed. Maybe we were there for only four or five days, but it seemed like weeks to me. In fact, looking back now, it seemed like a dream. It's the way one would choose to live if one had limitless resources and no real responsibilities. This event really has stuck in my mind. The way I view it now, in addition to recognising its dreamlike qualities, is that it was the thin dividing line between the end of youth, in a sense, 
and the beginning of my adult life. When we returned from our little adventure, my older brother went to live with some of his mates in what I would call a late 20th, early 21st century hippie commune of sorts. At least, that's what it seemed like. He would make a home for himself here for several years. I went back to my mum's place and started looking for gainful employment pretty much straight away. She wanted me to start bringing home some bacon, so to speak. My younger brother was just starting college at this time, so I was admittedly looking at him with an envious eye. I managed to sign up with an employment agency, which operated hand in hand with the local dairy. I got shifts almost as soon as I signed up. The basic shift was 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. The first day stands out, as I had until that point never really done a day's work in my life. I had lots of energy, so it wasn't as if I was getting tired out, but the job was very repetitive. The line bosses were clearly full of themselves, and enjoyed giving us youngsters a hard time. After a couple of weeks, I was moved to night shifts. This is what happens when you don't make a good impression with the higher-ups. I wasn't really the sort to kiss arse and be thankful for the opportunity to be a toad. But it actually worked out pretty well, for a while there. When I was on night shifts, I was left to my own devices for much of the night after most senior staff buggered off around midnight. So me and a couple of other lads took the opportunity to really take the piss. On an eight hour shift, we probably got away with slacking off around the back of the factory for a good three hours. What were we doing back there? Smoking pot and talking shit. Setting the world to rights by fantasizing about who we would like to kill and why. The first two lads I started nights with were sacked after a couple of weeks for talking back a little too much to the superiors. I managed to last a bit longer. I, in fact, started taking more liberties as I went along. There were no cameras in the two-bit operation that was the dairy, so I thought to myself one day, why don't I just walk out of here a couple of hours early? Would I really be noticed? Well, I went ahead and did this on one Wednesday morning, thinking this could be an immediate dismissal if I'm caught. But I didn't get caught. I got away with doing this time and again, and no one ever called me on it. The reason I did get fired made me glad that I had taken the piss all those weeks. I went over my break time by about 10 minutes and so one of the line managers reported me who in turn informed the agency who said they had to let me go in a rather short phone conversation. When I told my mum she didn't seem to be that bothered. She said something like plenty of other menial jobs out there No one's first gig works out. This seemed a bit out of character for her, but I pressed on anyway. After a couple of weeks, I found a job as a lab assistant working on site near the local coal mine. 
You have to bear in mind that around this time, all of the major coal mines around the country were closing down. It was a dying industry, limping towards extinction. Even so, there was still some good money to be made and some key experience to be gained. So what did I find out? I found out that the industry was run by gangsters posing as legitimate businessmen. My boss was a man named Ned. He was one of the lower downs. Clearly, there was money coming into the office and the lab that had nothing to do with selling coal to various sectors. I'm not sure what tricks were being done to balance the books, but I'm confident that tricks were being pulled. I can imagine that a few local officials might well have known a lot about what was going on in the industry. For my part, I just kept my head down for what would have been about six months and did my job. The fact that older guys were now trusting me to look after their workstations and mine the place here and there gave me some confidence and belief in myself. I guess this would have been the first time I felt something approaching job satisfaction. But of course, eventually the place was shut down. I was released from my contract a couple of months before the final winding up of operations. I was a little sad it was ending. A lot of the guys who were in there will have never worked again after that. That would have been the end for them. Don't get me wrong. I'm an environmentalist. I understand that we have to stop using fossil fuels and stop poisoning the planet in other ways, but this was the end of a way of life which will have destroyed men and families. Once more, I managed to bounce back fairly swiftly and got myself a job as an office junior. It was not immediately apparent to me that there was something wrong with my boss, but as time passed, I started to see it the way he spoke to his wife in moments when he thought I wasn't within earshot were disturbing. And I heard the same tone in his voice when he was lecturing his teenage daughter. He spoke to me like I was stupid or hard of hearing. Classic belittling tactics. I think the reason I tolerated this for quite some time, almost a year, came down to a few factors. Firstly, he didn't like being in the office too much and would go missing for days at a time. Secondly, I got on pretty well with his wife. Thirdly, I was doing a couple of qualifications at the time which I wanted to finish before I fucked off elsewhere. It was close to Christmas when the big incident occurred. His wife didn't come in at 9am one Friday and she didn't phone in either so I was concerned. Hours passed with just me trying to deal with phone calls from insurance companies. In the early afternoon A bloke called Dave, who was a friend of my boss and his wife, came in and told me I was to shut the place for the weekend. He told me that my boss, Greg, had been attacked by his brother-in-law and was in hospital. The wife, Carol, was also in hospital. When I asked what had happened to Carol, I didn't get a straight answer. Later, 
I would find out after doing a little digging that Greg had assaulted his wife in a drunken rage. And when Tom, the brother-in-law, got wind of this, he went round and savagely beat Greg. These were not minor incidents. Carol almost passed away, I understand, and Greg had a fractured skull as a result of the attack. I was on paid leave for a while. I decided to hand my notice into Greg after he had returned to the office. He didn't ask me why, nor did he seem to give a fuck, so that was the end of that episode. Bad times. I suppose it would have been about this time that I started to go off the deep end. I wasn't happy with where I lived or the way things were working out. For the next couple of years, I spent my time swinging between factory jobs and the welfare office. I started to drink heavily and became increasingly resentful, I suppose, about my lot in life. What was bothering more than anything, I think, was that I could see other people my age getting on with their little lives, getting married, starting families, holding down jobs, and enjoying themselves. I was slipping down, though. I was trapped inside myself as a young adult, just as I had been as a kid. Being normal is not something I ever desired. But it's not so much fun being a leftover. That's how I saw myself, one of the leftovers. So what did I do next? I retreated from the respectable and conventional world. I went to live with my brother for a while in the commune I mentioned earlier. I stopped drinking so much, but things were not about to get better. I started using drugs again, but more heavily than before. I started getting friendly with a dude called Stan, who was kind of the leader of the squat. That's what it was, a squat. After he started to trust me, he started asking for favours, as you might be able to imagine. Soon enough, I'm one of the lads who's going over to the wholesaler to pay the man and pick up the goods. And the goods included hash, MDMA, speed, and oh my fucking god, what's this bag of brown powder? Yep, you guessed it. Powdered gravy, Bisto. No, it was smack. I'm on foot. All the time doing these pickups. Walking through town with fairly large quantities of heroin in my little backpack. This was causing some degree of anxiety. I started wearing the clothes I used to wear to the office so as to give myself a more respectable appearance. I was clean shaven and dressed to impress, which kept the cops away. That's kind of sad, don't you think? It's essential evidence that we still live in a class-based society. Anyway, my brother decided to go into rehab as he was in a bad way. He warned me to stay away from the brown powder before he left. I was living in a place where I could see firsthand what this stuff was doing to people. It was taking away everything from these kids in a matter of months. I did start popping pills, opioids, to deal with my anxiety. But I did take my older sibling's advice. I never have taken heroin. 
if I had started on it back then, I don't believe I would have come out the other end. I have troubles with my conscience to this day about my involvement in that nasty commune. You could taste the decay in the air when you were around the place. I don't know why the cops didn't shut it down. They were busting junkies for possession outside the place on the regular. Why they didn't raid us I will never know. See, there's a paranoid voice still whispering in my head. And it's telling me that the police were under instructions to allow the squat to keep operating. I mean, there were other squats in the area, but none as large as ours. We had 30 to 40 people laying around the dump on weekends, and still 20 or so every other day of the week. No one actually died in the place because Stan and his closest buds, Jared and Barney, were not letting anyone shoot up in the place. We know a couple of the kids died in a nearby park. One was only 19 years old. I'm not going to say his name. I made a lot of money in a relatively short amount of time, but I got to a point where I could not look myself in the mirror without feeling disgust. Self-loathing was taking hold. I knew I had to change the way I was living radically, so I got out. Without telling Stan or anyone else, I just walked away from the squat. I had had enough of myself, had enough of the self-indulgent and self-destructive lifestyle. Nothing good was ever going to come out of that place. It wasn't a retreat for artists or free spirits as some saw it. It was a hotel of the damned. So I fucked off. But it wasn't just that place I had to get away from, it was the whole area. I needed to see something new. I thought now would be a very good time to just blow, leave it all behind. I had some dirty cash saved up so I could go wherever I wanted. I didn't owe anyone any money, and the cops weren't looking for me as far as I was aware. I told my mother I had just had to get away. She was disappointed to see me doing this, but she got why I was going. I explained it the best I could. She had a pretty good idea what was going on with me and the other lads about town, so she knew that I would only keep spiralling if I stayed. So off I went, to Brighton. Why Brighton, you may well ask. Why the fuck not? I fancied a bit of city living. I packed up a bag of clothes and took some but not all of my important papers with me. I got on a train and I said goodbye to the stomping grounds of my youth. And yes, it was a bittersweet moment as the train pulled out of the station. Jesus, I'm a cheesy fuck. I know I am, but these moments do happen in life. As if it could have been written by a lazy hack piecing together a crappy sitcom plot. When I got to Brighton, I was taken aback by the place. East Sussex just had a very different feel to it than where I grew up. I stayed in hostels to begin with before I was able to get a house share with a couple not too far from the town centre. They were a little older than I was. Darren would have been in his early 30s, and his Mrs. Sonny would have been late 20s. Believe it or not, they were the first mixed-race couple I had ever had any meaningful interaction with. They were both really cool. She was a programmer, you know, coding and all that stuff. And he was a fitness coach. I bullshitted my way in there, as I said I had a job lined up. I was tempted to tell some other lies, as they were questioning me to determine my suitability as a housemate. I managed to refrain, though. I can actually be quite charming when I want to turn it on, and when I want something, I will turn it on. I settled in okay. Then I set about throwing my CV into the receptionist's hands of every hotel I happened to walk past. 
I had never worked in catering before, so I fancied trying my hand in the kitchen. But because I had no experience in this field, I thought I wouldn't get many offers. I was right to think this. But I got a couple of bites. At the time, I just wanted to get back into the swing of things and to forget where I'd just come from. I took the first job that was offered to me, so I would be dishwashing and cleaning at a four-star hotel. The previous porter had just walked out, and they were desperate for the help. So I was in the right place, and my timing was spot on. It was hard, shitty work for minimum wage, but it was honest labour. No one could have argued that point. I got on well with the head chef and the owner from the start, as I was the guy who wasn't saying no to anything. Over time, and extra shifts were coming my way, and I was going hard and heavy. I got into good shape and found a routine which I could live with. I worked for these guys for a long time. I would go on to work for a pub and restaurant for even longer after this. Maybe for the first year or so I would get a little homesick. It would happen out of nowhere sometimes. I would just be working away or sitting in my room when nostalgic thoughts or playbacks of various situations would flash into my head. This did fade in time though. I made the south coast my home. I didn't want to run away. There was nothing to run away from. I was still smoking pot and popping pills occasionally, but I would keep it on the down low. I met a weed dealer called Francis. We hit it off pretty much straight away. I would go to see him twice a week, and I would always stay over for an hour or so at his flat, just talking about this and that. In front of his mates, he would clearly be putting on a more masculine front. People would come and go. When it was me and him, I could see him deflate somewhat, if that makes sense. He loosened up and relaxed when it was just the two of us. I got the feeling that it was only a matter of time before he made a pass at me. When he finally did, it was a little more clumsy than I was anticipating. He was a little embarrassed by his less than smooth move, but I was soon able to put him at ease and slow things down. We sat on his sofa kissing for quite a while. When he got a knock at the door, it kind of startled both of us. I told him I would come back later. He looked hurt but nodded anyway. I don't think he imagined I would come back. When I did come round to knock on his back door at around midnight, I heard him almost run down the stairs. He was all smiles when he opened up to see me standing there. I was a little drunk, if memory serves. I'd never quite seen Francis like this. This was him with mask all the way off, I reckon. He was wearing what you might call more feminine clothing than you would see him in during working hours. We picked up where we left off with some passionate kissing. Soon enough clothes were all over the floor, and we were giving each other, well, you know, things escalated from there. I don't want this to turn into an erotica type description here. I'll just say that we were up all night and a full tube of lubrication was put to good use. I was surprised to learn that Francis had never been with another man. He could have fooled me. I don't know. Maybe he was lying. Yeah, maybe he was giving me a line. But hey, you know, what can happen sometimes if you get into a compromising situation with a guy who has an experienced intimacy with another male is a fight or flight reaction. A moment of panic, I guess, where a crisis of masculinity forces its way to the front. I've had this happen to me a couple of times. 
one of those occasions did turn to violence actually. I was punched in the midsection and sort of kneed in the shoulder and side of the head. That guy left without saying a word. I was okay physically, but it did shake me mentally and emotionally. I didn't get romantically involved for some time after that. But back to Francis. He was a nice enough lad. We kept seeing each other fairly regularly until such time as he started seeing a young lady called Natasha. She sort of reminded me of Liz back in college, but perhaps not being quite as confident. Francis was clearly keen to show her off around town. Rumours about his sexuality, maybe spread around by some of his customers, had made him insecure, I believe. I didn't see Francis too much for a while as I started cutting back on the weed. I can recall that around this time, I had gotten a mobile phone for the first time and also purchased a laptop. I was a little slow to catch up with all the social media shit and the rest of it. Anyway, one day, I get a phone call from Francis asking if I could come over. So, I agreed with some level of apprehension. When I got there, he and his girlfriend were having a playful back and forth conversation. Francis went for his bag of stash and said, you want a quarter, right? He winked at me with a serious look about him. I said, yeah, sure, not knowing quite what the crack was. I exchanged a few pleasantries with Natasha. She then said she would be back in a couple of hours. She left and Francis informed me she was doing the weekly shop. I guess... She must have moved in, judging from the look of the place. You know how you can just tell when a woman has taken up somewhere and things are a bit more organised and yet at the same time somewhat more crowded? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. She could not have been out of the door for more than two minutes when Francis started pouring his heart out to me and told me he needed me back in his life. It came off as more desperate than manipulative. This is one of my big problems. One of my problems I've come to see. I can be far too soft and can be polite to the point of pathology. What I should be doing when I hear someone talk like this is head straight for the door. But I didn't. I sat there for maybe half an hour listening to him and trying to be very understanding. This only encouraged him. That wasn't what I was looking to do at first. I was actually repelled by this meeting and this tactic of his. But... Towards the conclusion of our chat, he had turned me around. He even shed a few tears. That did it for me. I'm a sap, I guess. So what did we do? The blinds were drawn in the kitchen. I walked in there without saying a word. He did follow, as I suspected he would. We looked at each other for maybe ten seconds before we both started cracking and smirking. Then it was a race to see who could take all their clothes off first. He won. This was a real quickie, but amazingly satisfying. Rarely does a fuck go so well for me. Chemistry isn't an easy thing to get right. Any sort of imbalance and things can go badly. Maybe you know that for yourself. But this was special. I suppose that's why I brought it up. But I did feel bad about it. 
I told him I reckoned he should try and make a go of it with Natasha. I said that I didn't want to be that spicy little bit on the side. I wasn't going to ruin his relationship, not deliberately. He did phone me a couple of times after that, but I ignored him. I stopped going around there for weed. I did see him around town now and then with his missus. Uh, I would be civil. Yeah, I could sense tension, of course, but as with anything, if you leave it long enough, the heat will die down. And die down it did. A long time has passed since this little affair, but I feel as if it set the tone and the pattern for my romantic involvements. What do I mean by this? I mean that I seem to attract a certain type of man. Maybe he is involved with someone else and he is keeping it a secret. I sense I get lied to routinely. Maybe he isn't involved, but he's struggling with himself. When I'm attracted to such a person, I will feel compassion on top of the old desire. But I will fall into these moods where I'm very displeased with myself. I wouldn't call it shame. I just wish I wasn't so inclined to keep being attracted, keep being drawn to this character type. This man who takes many physical forms. I don't want to come to terms with this and accept the status quo. I want to change things. I want to change. I moved away from Brighton last year. And now I live in a new country. New people, same old me. I'm kind of a fan of fresh starts. But things don't stay fresh for so long. You stay somewhere long enough, it will grow on you. Like mould. Some ideas and emotional states I've left behind in my youth. I'm not young anymore. Not so resilient. As former versions of Trent. But hey, Trent still feels like a leftover. There is such a thing as a bulk of humanity, and I'm not a part of that. I'm on the fringe, not in the largest bubble. Not labouring under the illusion that my existence has any inherent meaning. I must be an addict. The zest has gone, but the desire to push on remains. The desire which contradicts cold reason. I enjoy the contradiction. <laughs>